Thank you, Christian Lim, for giving me the word to introduce myself. So uh, I have been working mostly on the registration system development, and uh, you have seen me maybe presenting at the CLA Symposium in the past, some of the bad inventions that were out there that are no longer alive. And now we are, uh, now we are leading with Christian this uh, CLI symposium. It was mostly his work, okay? So if you can give him one more round of applause, that's for him. <laughs> and I will pass it back to you. Sure. Uh, uh, All right, um, so I'm Christian. Uh, I'm sure some of you know me, some of you don't, but uh, I'm the you know, person who tried to get this CLI symposium to next level, and I think I'm glad that we did so, uh, with um, actually a lot of help from Lydia, so let's go give a round of applause for her, for sure. <laughs> and I'd like to also thank uh, Tomas as well, for sure, because I mean, uh, without Tomas, I mean, if I have any kind of a logistics issue or anything that is you know, kind of hard to resolve, I depend on Tomas to do it, right? So the fact that he was there always when I needed the help, uh, I need to actually, uh, Know, express sincere thank of gratitude. So let's do that. Uh, Tomas, thank you. And then, yeah, I mean, like uh, with that, um, I guess the things I will uh, mention is I'm a co-chair uh, with Tomas on this uh, CLI symposium. I'm quite honored to be here, of course, and I do see that a lot of people are in the background. So maybe next year we can have a bigger room. So um, hopefully you can do that. Um, and with that, uh, let's start. So today, and maybe I would like to say, uh, sorry, Nikolai, not yet, uh, but we will invite you in a second. So I just want to circulate uh, through your uh, thinking whether this is the format that you would like to see in the future, right? We have a presentation, but uh, we record it, that's it. But we could also have the format that uh, we would have a regular call for papers, and you could submit a proposals that we would peer review. It's totally... <laughs> Up to your interest, we can do that. Uh, we could have, let's say, Springer, uh, Springer proceedings, but keep in mind that there is like 33% acceptance rate. So what we want to sort of get into your uh, thinking, would this be the direction that you would like to go with and have the opportunity to actually have a full paper uh, eventually coming out of this in the next year, or do you want to uh, keep up with this sort of format that it's solely a presentation? That's something that we might collect later on through the feedback, so think about about it, please. Both of it is possible, right? Uh, we also want to share initiative of Eric Baker, who unfortunately couldn't join us. So we have a backup for uh, his speech, but he is running a journal on competitive programming. And that would be a journal that, uh, of course, is in a reputable um, a publisher, and uh, you could submit it there. But at this point, we don't do any peer review. So we cannot just transform anything into an uh, indexable, citable uh, reference. Once we have the peer review process, if that's the direction we want to go, uh, then we can definitely do that. So we are uh, more than uh, excited to hear from you. What is it you want to do? We want your feedback. Not now. Think about it. We will have three cool presentations. You can shoot uh, shout at us uh, later on. What is it you want? You can also stop us throughout any other session that we have and ask. You can send us email. Our emails are up there, so if you go to the CLI symposium, you can do that. We certainly want to know what is it you want to do, because this is for you, this is not for us. And I will stop talking, you will stop talking, and we will invite Nikolai Kalinin. Are you here? All right. All right. Thank you for the kind invitation. Um, maybe we have a minute for all the people in the background to move and take a seat. There are a lot of empty seats there. And maybe also keep the entrance open so that other people can also come in and stand there where you're stand, where you standing now. Oh, there are lots more chairs, that's good. Should we wait a minute until all the chairs are there? I think we can go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, then my name is Nikolai Kalinin, and uh, well, my primary occupation is actually doing some quantum optics at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Light, but I'm here today because I'm also supervising contests at Cold Forces, and that's what I will be talking today. So uh, I'm pretty sure that most of you actually know what Cold Forces is. It's like the, one of the biggest 
uh, competitive programming online platforms. And I want to start with this slide, uh, where for the almost 15 years already, we've, we've been holding contests, and now we have on average more than 10 official contests per month. And when you think about this number, it's actually pretty huge. I, uh, I joined Code Force in around 2016, and then I was coordinating around six rounds a month, and that was already a lot of work. And that's pretty impressive that we've moved a long way since then. Um, you can see that by our statistics, we had some spike in Corona times because obviously a lot of people started joining contests from home. Uh, but it turned out that it's actually pretty hard to maintain this number of contests, like in some months, more than 20 contests. So we had to slow down a bit and still return to this average of around 10 contests a month. So if you are not very familiar with the contests, we have actually around five different types of contests at Code Forces. We have, I would say, competitive Division 1 and Division 2 contests, with Division 1 being the most difficult one of all the competitions that we hold, with top people competing for sometimes for big prizes. Division 2 is also a competitive division where we uh, have original and interesting problems, but they are not that hard as in Division 1, so it's more for people who are uh, not yet at the top of the world. And then we also have three other series, the educational series, which is similar in difficulty to educational, but have more standard problems. And also, there are divisions three and four, which are more for beginners, so to say. So if we combine all of these together and count the number of participants each month, it turns out that recently, even after the corona spike, uh, where actually some people thought that, okay, maybe after the corona there won't be so many people participating, but actually no, it keeps growing, and we are now hitting almost 200,000 participations a month. This is actually, again, you cannot imagine this number because uh, I just looked at the invitation that ICPC sent me, and there are about 70,000 participants in this season in ICPC, so that's more than twice as much participations in a month. Of course, a lot of people participate more than once, but still, uh, you can see that this is a very important uh, global event, and all of these people come from all around the world. We don't have any limitations on where you participate, on your status, or on your age, for example. So this is truly the competitions from, for everybody, and that's actually the topic of my talk, I would say, because while we have the competition for everybody, we also want that the competition comes from everybody, that the competition comes from the community. And to this, I have this very nice picture. Um, unfortunately, you cannot see the boundaries of the continents on, on this slide because of poor projector, but you can almost see the continents here, and that's where our authors come from. Out of so many contests that we held, I took the official, like, uh, each user can set a town in their profile. I took all of the public data there and plotted here, and you can see that actually the authors of Code Force Round come from all around the world, and that's what we are proud of, and that's what we want to keep up. Because we think that it's very important that we do not stick to one particular region with, let's say, a specific set of problems, specific ideas, but actually our problems come uh, from everyone. Uh, to help with this huge amount of number uh, authors, we also, of course, we cannot just let people set a contest and make it official for 20,000 participants, so we have to curate them, we have to coordinate them, and our coordinators also come from all different parts of the world. Well, there are uh, not that many coordinators now, and also not all of them have public location in their profile, so maybe uh, it's not all of the places that they come from, but we are actually trying now to also expand the set of people who control the uh, competitions and who choose the tasks, so that again, 
I'm pretty sure that if you just keep one person selecting the problems, then eventually this problem, this person will select the same type of problems again and again because he likes or she likes these problems. But our idea is that every problem should have a chance, if, if it's a good problem, should have a chance to appear. That's why we try to also uh, create like different filters by choosing different coordinators from all different uh, parts of the world. And uh, I want to just step, take a step aside because not all of our contests are coordinated. And apart from official contests, we have actually even more contests which are not curated, which are in gym and mashup. There is a small difference between them, but it's not very important. And that's where our authors come from there. And there are now hundreds of thousands of contests created by all of these authors from around the world. And I think our goal here in this type of competitions is that we need to provide some tools to ensure that the competitions have good quality. Even though there is no like trained person that would choose a problem, that would uh, check that the problems are prepared carefully, we still want to make sure that the authors themselves can use quite a number of tools to actually make their, uh, make their problems very well prepared. Um, yeah, and the number of such contests, as, is, as I said, is reaching like 8,000 a month, which is, uh, you cannot underestimate this number. So, yeah, rounds by the community and for the community. So what it takes to create a round? Well, I think there are three, three major steps. First, the problems should be selected, the problems should be prepared, and the problems should be tested. I put the second uh, and first steps in the reverse order here on this slide because sometimes it's not worth preparing a problem when after it would be tested, it would be discarded, right? So that's actually what we do sometimes, that we only prepare like a shell of a problem and give, them, give the problem to the testers. And then we decide whether the problem is worth preparing or not. So as I said, we want to keep our authors diverse, so to say. So anybody from the first division can propose a contest. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, if you are familiar with the system, we have some queue of proposals, but it's not that large, like maybe half a year now. And then, of course, even though we select only like the top users, I don't know, maybe Div1 can, has 10% of the all of the users at code forces, still even at this proposal step, more than half of the problems are rejected because they're not too new, not too interesting, just bad or incorrect. Even without any limitation on what a coordinator can choose because we trust our coordinators that they can choose good problems for their contests. Even with that, we have to reject a lot of problems, but that's let's say an easy step. Uh, yeah, there is a funny fact that around 50 <laughs> problems were rejected from some proposals and uh, a typical contest is just five problems. So the authors had to pr suggest 10 times more uh, problems to actually select a set which is uh, good enough for us to prepare. Then, uh, as I said, first I want to say a few words about the first step that the problems need to be tested, and that's again a problem of holding contests for a wide community, because when we hold a contest for all the participants in the world, there would be different opinions, there would be different, uh, I would say there would be uh, different ideas of how a good problem should look, should look like, and that contains both like whether the problem is interesting, whether the problem is written carefully in a simple English, so to say, so that everybody can understand that. And also if the problem has, hasn't appeared before, because when you hold a contest for 20,000 participants, even if a problem appeared at some regional contest a year ago, 
you would notice that and people would complain. So actually a good step that we took in the past 10 years is that we moved from two testers testing each round to around 20 random testers from all uh, countries. And that gives us a lot of good results that every round is now adjusted after testing based on difficulty of the problems, based on feedback of the testers. And actually, I would say every second round gets some problems that appeared in some contest in some region a year ago, two years ago. And testers said, no, we cannot use this problem. So that would be impossible without this step. And then if we return to the preparation step of the contest, when you work with all these authors, which most of them prepare their contests for the first time, we have to have good guidelines for them because otherwise it would take a lot of time or your problem would be incorrectly prepared. But people don't follow guidelines. <laughs> it, <laughs> if, you, if you write something more than two lines, then people, 50% of the people won't read that. And even those who read would forget about that in five minutes. So we have to have some tools to check whatever we want, whatever we want, we want to check in the contest, and whatever we can, to check, we can check. And then, of course, we also have coordinators. But it's quite difficult to find extremely experienced coordinators who can choose the problems and who know what to, how to prepare the problems, who know how to um, check whether the problem is correctly prepared. So, and these coordinators also would not follow guidelines for checking the problems. <laughs> so we have to introduce some checklists so to make sure that every coordinator has to go like through some specific checks because we had, over the history, we've had so many stupid mistakes in the problems. Like, you know, there is tests and pretests, and even not that long ago, we almost started a contest and one problem didn't have pretests because it was not created. It is not that easy to check if you don't have it on your checklist because that's normally you would just have it. So when you produce like 10 rounds a month, you have to have very specific points uh, where you should focus. So now I wanted to talk a little bit about the tools that we use. Um, yeah, so there is the same, more or less the same three parts of creating a round. We have the testleap.h library that is used for all the programs that we need to write in addition to the solution. Uh, that is validator, uh, interactor if we need, uh, generators and checkers, of course. So without the test leap, I think modern uh, competitions would be impossible. I know there are other libraries that do a simple, uh, similar job, but again, in order to keep the rounds coming, we have to stick to one solution because otherwise the coordinators wouldn't know what are the functions that the, other, that the authors use. Then we have the polygon system, which I'm pretty sure a lot of you are also familiar with. This is uh, a website that allows you to collaborate on problem preparation. Because again, I remember 10 years ago, maybe a little bit more, the best tool that you can have was a SVN repository to make sure that people can collaborate and then some TXT file on who does what. Well, with Polygon, it's now better and better and actually well, I will talk a little bit about that later. And then, yeah, code forces is needed for coordinating the rounds, actually choosing the problems, guiding the authors, and also testing from a variety of testers. So a few words about TestLeap. It's an open source C++ library to simplify all the tools that we use in competitive programming. Uh, this is a simple validator using TestLeap. As you can see, it checks. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see well on this screen, uh, but it uses some simple functions like readint and gives the bound that this integer should be between this and this bound to satisfy the constraints of the problem. And this validator is called on every test to make sure that the tests are correct. 
uh, and this is used again for checkers, validators, and interactors, and just a few points that uh, are new to, to sleep if you have used that for a long time but don't follow the development. Now it's very, uh, very uh, easy to check the constraints because TestLeap would report the actual constraints that you wrote into TestLeap. So, for example, for the variable t here, the upper bound is 10,000, and then the TestLeap would read, write in a sep separate file that, okay, we have a variable t that is checked between 1 and 10,000, and if you somehow can extract the same values from your statement, some system can check that the actual constraints are correct. Because uh, before that, it was always done like manually by looking at the statement, aha, uh -huh, we have 10,000 here, we have 10,000 in the validator. Now it's very conveniently incorporated in Polygon. So if you are developing a problem, please use this. Um, yeah, and another method that many people still don't use is that readint and similar functions can actually read arrays. So you don't have to create a loop and pass the index of the element that you're reading. You can just use inf.readints and specify the number of elements. It will return you a vector, which is just a small tip. And then for the future of TestLeap, actually I have to say that TestLeap is quite an old library and outdated in parts. So, uh, but of course the development is also very slow because basically it's Mike who is developing it with some uh, other help as well. And the most important thing that we want to do is to actually remove the generators from TestLeap and move it to a separate library. And for this I have the idea that we have to separate our generation of our tests into, sep into several levels. Like we have the basic random source with, with good source of random. And then we have some helper functions which also exist in a current TestLeap um, code like generate a random permutation or a partition or something like that. And then we can also have in this library some often used patterns like generate me a binary tree or uh, a bamboo tree or whatever, or some specific arrays like sorted arrays or partially sorted arrays and so on. And then my idea for the future would be that we would actually have some test sets based on this library that we can just plug in into some library. Let's say that we have a problem about a tree. Maybe we can have a list of calls to this, um, to this library that will generate us all the interesting trees that people found interesting over the time. That would be uh, like a binary tree, a star tree, a bamboo tree, and so on. Because there are so many trees that people usually miss in the tests, like if you want to build a good test against a square root decomposition um, solution, you would need a very specific tree. And it's not very easy to generate all the times. So I hope uh, if you have any ideas on that, on how to properly develop that, then uh, I will be very happy to discuss that with you. So we have a polygon system. Again, a few words about that. Uh, that uh, everyone can use it to develop problems. and. There are a lot of contests all over the world that use the system to cooperate on uh, creating contests. And just uh, very quickly, a few new features that you can now automatically translate the statements and solutions with the artificial intelligence different languages, human or programming. And also this helps a lot for our foreign authors to create correct like grammatically correct statements for uh, all the languages uh, that is English and Russian that we use on code forces. And again, as I said, with, as I said, with TestLeap, uh, together they now can check whether the constraints are correct in the problems. As you can see here, a Polygon will give you a warning if a variable n is two in the statement, so the lower bound is two in the statement, but if the validator only checks if it's at least one, you will have a warning which will greatly simplify the development of your program. And a couple of tips on the polygon if you are using it. There is a, 
an API of Polygon that you can use, and there is a Python wrapper for it in this link. I think the slides will be available at some point, right? So we can follow the link or just remember. And there is a command line tool that Paul Konowski developed that can also help you develop a problem in Polygon um, quite nicely. And using that for code forces, we implemented an, a series of additional checks on the statements and all the, of the additional files to make sure that these guidelines or these checklists that the authors and coordinators are following are actually uh, implemented correctly. So we implemented that simply as a Discord bot. You give it a number of contest and it checks a number of, uh, number of things. For example, here you can see that uh, we have a policy that the problems A, B, and C should, be, should have an okay solution in PyPy, and I guess some of the problem is missing it, so there is a warning about that. So, as I said, the key to actually run a contest for tens of thousands of participants when only a few people work on the contest is that to have a very specific guideline to have strong systems that can develop, that can detect issues automatically, and have everything else that you can check written down in the checklist, and make sure that the checklists are easy to follow. Because again, people won't read if you write more than a page. Just a few words about challenges that we have uh, when creating contests from the community. Well. <laughs> One of the most uh, annoying challenge is that some authors just vanish at some point and stop responding. And I mean, you spend half a month selecting problems and helping them develop them. And then the authors reappear in three years and say, oh, we, we now work in industry. We are not more interested. So um, I don't know how to deal with that. Then we have non-trustworthy authors that actually leak solutions. But fortunately, and I'm very happy to say that that happens very, very rare, uh, and we only had like a few contests that were ruined by that. Well, uh, and there is of course cutting corners in preparation that what I was talking about, that people just don't follow guidelines and don't read the checklist. Um, and there is, I don't know, a good solution to that other than actually come and check. Um, there are, of course, technical challenges to what we do. When we create so many rounds, we cannot always be sure that the statements are crystal, crystal clear. This is actually not about the number of contests that we make, but the number of participants that we have. Because if there is something, so in a typical round, we have maybe between 50 and 100 questions on the statements during the round in two hours. But if something is unclear, we have this hundred number, hundreds of questions in a few minutes. So, and you can imagine that when 20,000 people participate in a contest, they will have, they will found, they will find something that is not so clear and ask a question. So I think we are do, doing actually good on that, but we don't know any good guidelines how to do crystal clear statements. We actually also don't have good guidelines on how to create good tests because, well, you have to be a very experienced author to create a good test set. And that's why I think this new feature of having test sets easily accessible would help us. And then we have the list of our problems probably is the coincidences of problems. Again, you you hold around and then somebody says, oh, in 2016, in this sub-region of Italy, we had a contest <laughs> where the, this problem has appeared. So I think it's, nowadays it's simply not possible, especially for easier problems, to remove all such um, coincidences. And my favorite example to that is in some journal that posted uh, or printed mathematical problems half a century ago, uh, they posted some problem about summing consecutive natural numbers, and then half 
a year later, uh, a letter came and was also printed in the, se in the next issue that this problem has appeared 50 years ago in 1930. And <laughs> even then, I already cited the result from 1912. So, I mean, what, what, can, what can we do? <laughs> Cheating is a large problem, as you can see here. This is the number of cheaters we removed from the contest each month again. So in the thousands and raising. And similar question would be what is actually a Div2 contest? Because I started with saying that it is also a competitive contest, but there are more and more nuances that we have to think about except for cheaters and now artificial intelligence that makes a lot of Div2 problems accessible, even if you don't know how to program. We also have another problem is that a lot of compilers have some implementation uh, specific, uh, specifics that make specific instruments unavailable to contestants because if a uh, if good tests are made, for example, the standard hash maps can be uh, slow and so on. And that actually ruins experience for a lot of people. When you are not a professional, you don't want to care about these things. On the other hand, if you add some problems that, have, that are not yet standard, but maybe they have appeared somewhere before, maybe it's not too bad for the... Uh, contestants, especially for those who are still learning. So this is a question that I will leave open, whether div 2 contests are good enough or not to be competitive. And I want to also thank all of our team, which is, well, the core team is pretty small. The, we'll have a lot of coordinators now whom I uh, thank a lot. There is also educational rounds, constant team. And I also want to thank all of the round authors and testers for all of the competitions and you for listening. Thank you, and I will be happy to answer the questions. So thank you, Nikolai, and I am here to uh, accept your questions. So I see hand there. Please don't start to scream. I will pass the <laughs> I will pass this guy so we can have it recorded. It, and if someone really have to have a coffee, have it now, but not throughout the session. Thank you. I actually have two questions for you. First, are, are these slides accessible outside of the uh, meeting today? Okay, awesome. And second, um, you, you were talking about the uh, the educational uh, divisions in D3, D4. Do you know of any cases where schools are using those to help uh, educate their students? I'm not aware of any school that using the actual uh, official rounds. I know that some schools actually select students for courses based on their code force rating. And I don't know, maybe someone from the audience can comment on that. Anyone wants to comment? Yeah, I did. Uh, in NUS, we use a uh, code force rating to select our team. Thank you. I see Christian. Uh, basically the same thing. Uh, we use that to uh, selection procedure for course and also for team selection. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, so you talked about some problem setting guidelines and those seem pretty useful. Are those available publicly anywhere? Uh, I'm sorry, what is available publicly? Uh, problem setting guidelines. Like, uh, oh, well, you should do this when you create a problem. Um, yeah, the problem guidelines are available and I have a plan to actually publish it after I... Uh, so, I mean, it's not a secret if you ask any code force authors, they are allowed to share. Uh, but also, I'm not yet publishing them because I have to publish them first. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Hi. Um, thank you for the, pre for the presentation. Um, I have controversial thoughts about, like, making rounds shorter, like two hours long, and, and I have wrote blog posts and a lot of upvotes on it, but I, 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 won't, I won't discuss for that. I, I have questions on, on Polygon. Um, 
So two questions. Uh, first, uh, is there a plan to make like preparing problems uh, offline accessible? So like sometimes you would like to like prepare problems when you're on a flight, long flight or something like that, and right now it's not uh, available. And the second, slightly related, is that any plan to make uh, Polygon open source? Uh, because like sometimes we we host a contest, but we don't really trust like the admins of Polygons, let's say, um, and we want to host it on our own. Uh, Server, let's say that, that only a set of committees can access, and we don't really know who the polygon admins are. So, like, yeah, those those two related questions, I guess. Um, Sorry, uh, yeah, my name is Jonathan uh, from Singapore. Yeah, the good questions. The first question is simple. We, uh, I think the best tool to work offline is a CLI tool by Paul Konavsky. If you follow this link, you can actually download all the the files from the problem, work on them offline, and then upload from console. Oh, oh, sorry. So this CLI is not like uh, calling Polygon API the, the server. So uh, even you can actually yeah, download most of the files there, edit them uh, offline, and then upload. And for the second question, I don't know exact answer. You better catch Mike somewhere. But I know that Polygon is able to run uh, on a separate instances, and it has been done several times. All right, thank you. I'll accept one more question as the time is reaching. So uh, how do you detect cheaters? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a question from a cheater. <laughs> uh, the simple answer is I don't know. I can make <laughs> Actually, I host a, a preliminary contest in Taiwan, and I got uh, 77 team cheating in the contest. So, uh, yeah. But they are from India. <laughs> I don't have such statistics. <laughs> so do you want to answer how do you detect the cheaters? Um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, Mike knows and Vladislav knows, but basically there is a a system that looks for similarities in the codes, and then a human would look over groups of similar solutions. I don't know the details. All right, so I thank you so much, uh, uh, Nikolai. Maybe if I can uh, do the last question, because I do the statistics on ICPC. So you present the numbers of uh, how many participants you have. Is this unique number of participants, or is this you count the same member if they participate in the same contest? No, this is the total number of people of participations in a month. Okay, so, uh, so as you said, yeah. if you compare it to the numbers that we got uh, for ICPC, we unique them. So if you yeah. participate five times, we count you just once. So yeah, that of course, yes. pretty much uh, reaches the same level, I would say. Yeah, I mean, in a single contest, we have 20 to 30 participants, uh, thousands of participants, so yeah. I don't know, I haven't counted unique numbers. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you. And I will do the token passing so that uh, Christian can enjoy this show as well. All right, um, so Riku, are you here? All right, thank you. So I'm Riku, and I'm working as an admin of AdScoder. Uh, if you don't know AdScoder, don't worry, I'll explain what it is. So, okay, let's go. Um, so AdScoder is a Japanese code forces ops, a Japanese <laughs> programming <laughs> contest platform. Um, we have uh, 80 plus official contests per year. Uh, 590 plus official contest archive, 600 secure users, 6 kilo plus tasks, 15 million plus submissions. So all of them are smaller than Code of Forces, unfortunately. But okay, so yeah, and we have rating system as Code of Forces does, and it looks like this. Yeah, this is pretty normal, and yeah, the left picture shows uh, some example of rating graphs. And we assign colors to each rated range. And the most high rate, highest rated people are assigned red. And the right picture shows the distribution of number of participants for each rated range. And as you can see, there is a strange peak 
on the left. And those are the people uh, who are registered for AtGoder uh, and they participate in a contest, but don't solve anything. So there are tons of such people. Okay. And if you look carefully at the graph, uh, this is uh, hard to see, but for example, there is a strange peak in 2000, for example. I mean, this is a, a cutoff of some range. So there do some people that uh, try to achieve some goal, and after achieving some goal, uh, in this case, for example, 2000, they stop participating. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I really hope those people still keep competing, <laughs> but yeah, that's what happens. And okay, so I ex I think uh, the situation is uh, almost the same as core forces. So I'll explain the difference between the core forces. Uh, the most important difference is that uh, quarter rating is harder to change. So, for example, in core forces, uh, one can get uh, minus three hundred and sixty-four. Drop. Actually, I have once experienced such a uh, huge loss, but in at uh, such big change doesn't happen uh, because uh, we believe that uh, one's ability doesn't change so quickly. So, so the rating change is moderate, and inevitably there is no big gain because one's ability doesn't evolve so quickly. Um, another difference is that. Uh, I said uh, we assign colors to for each rated range, and red is the highest rated people. But if you reach rating of 3,200, you can choose your own color. So if you reach that rating, uh, we we'll email to you, and you you can just send me some RGB code, and we'll set it. Uh, but uh, the fun fact about it is, there is one possible rejection scenario. You can. You can, pass, you can choose any color, but you can't choose a color that is the same as the background of the Artscoder website. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, actually uh, my favorite color was rejected for that reason. <laughs> <laughs> and also, uh, we give crowns to top 200. To crowns means uh, we, uh, I should have added a, a figure here, but um, in Artscoder, uh, the user's name, which shown with crowns if the users is placed in top 100. Uh, top 100 means active top 100. In AdScoder, if you stop participating for a contest two years, uh, you're considered to be an inactive user and, you're, and you don't have a crown. So the crowns are designed to indicate that which users are active. So like, for example, if you see a rating, ranking, you have so many people, but uh, some of them are without crowns, and you can see, oh, they are not, they are not participating, or just, otherwise, you can open a contest that 10 years ago, and if you see a rating with crowns, oh, they are still participating, and you can see it by crowns. And so, so in this slide, uh, I'm gonna express, explain some freaking ask questions about Outscorer. Uh, uh, the most, since I'm an admin, uh, the person who supervises problems, I get problems like uh, questions like this. Uh, at good beginner contest is hard for beginners, and why? At regular contest is too hard for below red parties, and why? AGC is too hard for everyone, why? So most of people are just saying at good contest is too hard, but. Uh, but actually, I, I don't think uh, we are designed to make a harder contest, and I'll explain the policy later. So, uh, before I'm going to uh, explain, before I'll explain contest itself, I'll explain the history of Outquarter. So, Outquarter started in 2012. Uh, in April, Outscorder regular contest 001 started. So this is the first ever Outscorder contest. And the fun fact is that this contest was canceled because the server was down. So uh, it is a very, very bad start for Outscorder. Uh, and two months later, Outscorder as a company was founded. And, and so, and two months later in August, the first sponsored contest in Atgora was held. So this is the first revenue Atgora got. And yeah, 
Then the next year in 2013, after the beginner contest 001 was held. So I'll explain who started this company. Uh, this is CEO Chokudai. Uh, Chokudai is, of course, the handle name. His real name is Naohiro Takashi, but uh, you, you should remember that this is handle Chokudai. Uh, he's founded at quarter in 2012. And uh, of course, he's a competitive programming addict. Uh, he ha his achievements are like this. Uh, he got uh, second place in TCO Marathon and in 2020 and 2017. Uh, he, has, he was a digital finalist. Uh, he also won a Google Hashcore champion 2022. So as you can see, um, so he is a competitive programming addict, but uh, his interest is in more put on some heuristic problems, not uh, like uh, some counting tasks or some algorithmic tasks. Um, so, but this is what, oh, so uh, the interesting fact about him is that uh, he's from the same high school as me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Then he found it at quarter in 2022. And, okay, so I'll explain so what does at quarter mean. Uh, and the name of the at quarter comes from uh, the quarter part is obvious because uh, it's about contest platform for coders. But uh, the real, the, the another reason is that uh, all all the founders loved top quarter, so they they try to name the company as something quarter, and they choose at because the founding members were working for a company that started with at. Uh, actually, I know what does blah 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 means, but yeah, but. The founding member said that uh, we can't explicitly say the company name. You can just say at blah, blah, blah. I, I don't know why, but <laughs> they just try to hide the exact name. So anyway, that's the origin of at scorer. So, and OK, this is very, very important notes. Uh, <laughs> at scorer, capital C is the correct one, and small c is incorrect one. OK. Please remember this. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about the repetition of AdCoder. Nowadays, AdCoder is considered to be a good problem provider. Some people even say AdCoder's contests are the best. And even, in, even for critics, AdCoder a, is a decent contest platform. Uh, however, but uh, what was the situation when AdCoder started? Uh, I picked a very Good example problem to show you how Adcoder was <laughs> Adcoder was when it started. So it's a problem from the first beginner contest. I'll read out the problem statements from now. Okay, I see brother was C. A certain anomaly that automatically recalls the wind direction angle and the wind runs every minute. The wind direction angle is defined by the setting, the truth knows the zero degrees and measuring the direction from which the wind is blowing clockwise from there with a best observation of 16 equal divided compass points to use uh, relationship between the six compass points. Uh, the corresponding angles have been shown the following uh, uh, full table. Uh, we have the uh, following table is given. <laughs> and the wind runs further to the distance at the anomaly of the travel within a certain period of time due to the wind. For example, the wind runs of uh, 300 meters per minute. It minute, means that the rotor is turned by wind traveling is 300 meters in one minute. This, in this case, the average wind speed for that minute is going to be calculated by dividing 300 meters by 60 seconds, resu resulting in 5 meters per second. And I plan to convert the given data into a form similar to the weather reports broadcast on radio. This weather reports the wind direction is given in 60 comps, points, and the wind strength is reported using the real fourth wind scale. Uh, the wind direction will be based on the 16 compass points from the table above. However, when the wind is throwing zero, it was important column represented by the special direction C instead of the 16 compass points. Will, uh, wind strength will be calculated by the routing of the wind specific to the realist tens and converting it to wind strength according to the following table. And you're also given this table. <laughs> Please create a program that takes the wind direction at angle when winds run per minute as input and that's with the data from data of the format of the weather reports, period. Okay, this is a problem. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay, well, first, this is a cherry picked example, of course, but the points I want to emphasize is that there is not a moderation process in these days, so such problem can appear in a contest. And therefore, only a few people considered at scooter to be a serious competition. Uh, for example, uh, in this era, 
I was grade eight or nine, and I was only doing uh, international uh, Olympiad informatics. So, and my senior stu senior student said, "Ah, you you don't need to do at coder. Uh, you can just focus on OIs." Uh, but nowadays, uh, the situation is different. There are even some students they that don't do at uh, they don't do OIs, but they only do at coder. So the so situation has changed dramatically since then. So when did the change happen? Um, it was uh, 2016, seven. Uh, 2016 July, Outcoder Ground Contest 01 started. And we also started providing English statements and the current rating system. So before this era, we are just a Japanese platform. And, and after this time, uh, we, the quality of the contest has dramatically improved, and we also increased the frequency of contests. And in 2018, Atkoder Beginner Contest has reached its 100th, and in the next month, Atkoder Regular Contest has reached its 100th, and in 2019, we reached uh, 100,000 users. So I said there was a huge change, so who made this change possible? It is uh, Adamin RNG58. Uh, he's a, he has joined Outcoder in 2016, and he's a real legend in Japanese competitive programming community. So here's a list of his achievements. He has won Top Coder Open Algorithm uh, for three times, and he has won Google Call Jam. On he has won. Facebook Hacker Cups, and he got third in ICPC World Finals twice. Uh, what makes him legendary in Japanese competing programming history is that no other Japanese had ever won a single major title. A uh, major title means uh, TC or GCC or FHC, so no other Japanese have won a single Japanese title, but he won five in total, so he's a true legend. And the fun fact about him is that He's also from the same high school as me. <laughs> and, and so, so, we, so in that quarter, we have Chokudai and RNG and me, so three from the same high school. So it's a small world. Then, okay. So, uh, from this era, the Art Quarters contest was, uh, became international. So, and I, I wanted to explain some very uh, beautiful problems as an example, but since this is an international, uh, international contest. Some of you may know, and or I really want you to try it by yourself. So I wanted to explain instead some domestic on-site contest platform problem. I mean, this is a tricky problem, but I think this is a little bit fun. So we have two subtasks for the problem. Like the first one is uh, construct a planar graph and output it. Of course, there is a uh, constraints on the number of part vertices. It was like 1,000 verses, so yeah. But constructing any planar graph and output, so output only problem. And the problem B is that given a planar graph, find a full coloring. So we know that there always exists a full coloring in a planar graph, but we don't have a good algorithm. So the second problem asks you to create some good heuristic. And the tricky part of this problem is that after the contest, submissions to A are fed to submission B to decide on the score. So the score of the submission to A is defined by the number of uh, submissions to B uh, that the graph generated by in the solution to A kills. And the score of the submission to B is defined by the number of submissions to A that this heuristic solves. So it is only possible in uh, where the number of contestants are so small that they can run for each pair of submissions. And that's why this problem appeared in the onsite contest. And a very good strategy to solve this problem, uh, subtask A, is to generate a random points on the plane and I made a Deloney triangulation. Actually, this is what I did during the real competition. Uh, actually, I was, only, I was the only one to have the Deloney triangulation on my hand at the time, and I beat all other heuristics. So. Actually, this is, the only pro this is my first outcoders domestic on-site contest I participated. So this is memorable, and this is the only problem that I did well on that contest, so this is very memorable for me.
And so at the on-site context has different, this kind of tricky problem here. But, okay, then let's get back to at the timeline. Okay, in 2019, uh, we had at quarter world fin tour finals. Okay, I'll explain it, explain the details later. And in 2019 April, we raised fans from the largest advertising company, it's called Dentsu. And before this time, our financial condition was not stable, but after this moment, we tried to, you know, our financial condition stabilized, and then we would we were able to move to a larger office. Uh, before moving to the larger office, our small was really small uh, that uh, we didn't have uh, our own restroom <laughs> in our room. So yeah, it is a very, very small company, but now we have a very good office. So, okay. Then in 2020, uh, the users reached 200,000, and in 2020, in December, at quarter ground contest has reached its 50th time. And in 2021, at quarter heuristic contest was started, and then 300 kilo users reached. And then at quarter beta contest has reached 200. So here you see a new contest, at quarter heuristic contest. So I'll explain later. So first of all, I'll explain. The Adamina of Arthur Ols or Z. Uh, he is the uh, Adamina of Atkuda Heuristic Contest. And Atkuda Heuristic Contest was uh, made possible because he joined Atkuda at that time. Uh, here's his achievement. Like he, he was a finalist of the TCO algorithm and he has won a TCO marathon in 2010 and he got third in GTJ 2009. Uh, he, champ he got Championship in Google Hashcode in 2022, and he also went to ICBC World Final in 2009 and uh, 2009 and 2010. So he's like doing a by, by player, like he's very do great, doing great on algorithm or marathon division. So, and he also doing very great as an engineer. So like he's a, a superman in our company. So okay, so and during. This period, I joined. I also joined at Scooter, so I um, explain my achievements here. Like I got TCL algorithm in second in 2022, or GCC finalist, which finalist, Google Hash Quarter champion, and fourth in IOI, or third in ICPC World Final. Um, yeah, this is yeah, this is decent, but compared to RNG, <laughs> it's just okay. <laughs> but, Okay, let's get back to the outcoder timeline. Um, we have, in 2022, 4,500 kilo users reached. In 2023, 3,500 kilo users reached. In 2023, outcoder being account is 300. And in 2023, September, outcoder world finals resumed. Actually, before this era, everything was messed up because of the COVID. And if you look at the timeline carefully, uh, these, these, days, these days we have, only something, oh, something has reached something, oh, okay. <laughs> because there's no, I mean, no major change these days because of the COVID, but in 2023, we finally restarted at Code of World to finals. And in 2024, we reached uh, 600 kilo users. So here's the basic timeline of the at -coder. Now I'm going to, um, oh, okay, so, okay, so, and these days, uh, we had another admin for a easier contest, ABC ARC admin Sunuke. So I'll explain him about him. Like he joined at Coder early, but as but worked as an engineer. So as you can see, uh, he's a TC algorithm finalist, GC finalist, FJ finalist, Google Hash Core third, ICPC World finals finalist. So he's a really good competitive programmer, and he has joined at Coder for several years, but he hadn't involved in any contest preparations for a long time. <laughs> That's kind of very unfortunate for him. So uh, recently he has, has joined our contest preparation team and he's been supervising ABCs and the ARCs. So I'm talking about, and so I say it about at quarter beginner contest started, the regular contest started, the grand contest started, here is the gonna start, but 
what are these in the first place? So I'll explain what are these contests. So the that's called a beginner contest is uh, most easiest contest. And its rated range is from zero to uh, less than 2,000. And it's most frequent. I mean, it's held on every Saturday. So every Saturday in at a fixed time. So this is very, I mean, regular contest. And this is most popular. I mean, we have like 10,000 participants in every contest. So this is real popular. And as I said, this is the easiest contest. But uh, sometimes even tourists fail to solve the last problem. Um, I mean, this is a bit, this is an example of standings. Um, Okay, as you know, Tiris is the uh, best program in the world, and but he can't solve the last problem, but this is the easiest contest. So how is this possible? Okay, I'll explain what is easy problem here mean. So the definition here is that you can solve it by technique. So for example, like in Atwater Beta Contest, the last problem is just a kind of calculate some maximum floors or implement some segment tree structures, but sometimes, <laughs> sometimes this hard problem can appear. And so, yeah, the technique can be very, very minor in some cases. So I'll explain, I'll explain uh, the problem that tourists didn't solve as an example to showcase uh, how is this possible. So the uh, problem is like you have n coins facing up and you give an integer sequence a and shuffle a and for each i flips coin to i plus i plus one so which means like for example you have uh, n coins and for each for each one two three you flip points for example two 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 plus one two two three four five and two plus eight two or like this and then you have to find the expected number face up coins after all operations so uh, okay then uh, this is just a easy part of it. okay actually this is the only ad hoc part of this problem so I will omit the details, but uh, but the last strain is important. This, uh, this problem can be uh, boiled down to the following problem. Like, given your sequence B, find the number of permutations. P says that uh, PI is not larger than BI holds for all the number of I's. So uh, I think uh, this part is just a very standard part. and But the harder part, Begins from here, and I think I believe that Therese didn't couldn't solve this problem, but uh, this problem was once explained in a quarter forces blog. Uh, I think if you're if you're familiar with quarter forces, you should have seen this blog, and yeah, it is from four years ago. So, and it has over one thousand upvotes. So many of you should know this blog. So, in theory, many people should be able to solve the problem. However, uh, however, only two people solve that solve this problem in the real contest. So, uh, my message is that uh, read Cordero Forces blogs carefully. <laughs> or, uh, or actually, what I wanted to say is that. Uh, Actually, I expected uh, that there are only a few solves in this problem, but I, but I thought uh, this there is some technique here uh, I want to express. Then I set such problem to ABCs because um, even though the problem is very hard, uh, there are some there are some known techniques and it is available to everyone. Then that should count as an easy problem. But actually, this is educational rather than easy. So ABCs can, can be expressed as a most educational contest. So, okay, so this is what the, oh, uh, am I too time consuming? Okay, I'll, <laughs> I'll wrap, <laughs> sorry. So I've got a regular contest is like regular contest uh, that has a rated range 
below red, and uh, only once or twice a month on average, and it's regular difficulty. Uh, but uh, for uh, I guess um, feedbacks from uh, LGMs about regular contest is too hard for uh, even for uh, these legends, and, and the reason why because that in ABCs uh, it, the definition of easy was really uh, clear that if you have some techniques and that is written or somewhere, uh, I can just put that problem to ABC. But in regular contests, uh, my policy is that if I feel the problem has similar techniques than an uh, existing problem before, then I put it to AR, AR regular contest. So that is too vague, and sometimes I'm too good to think a new problem as regular. So and then I said, OK, I'll start to uh, adjust to it. but. Uh, the things didn't change from them so much. So that's why uh, Snooke, uh, we decided to set another ARC Adam in Snooke. So uh, he has more moderate opinion about the problem is new or known or regular. So we have another Adam in here. And the most prestigious at contest is at the regular con grand contest, sorry. And he has a uh, rated range to. 2000 to infinite, and our goal is to hold it on a month, month, monthly, month by basis. Uh, but uh, actually, this is not achieved, and the contest is very difficult. Uh, for example, like this is a timeline about quarter grand contest. Like uh, in the first several years, we have uh, like 10. 10 agencies per year, but the number, the frequencies has decreased. For example, in 2022, we have only four <laughs> contests in a year, and uh, and in 20, in this year, uh, we still I've hold two agencies at this point this year. So <laughs> I hope to hold more in in the in remaining months. So so why is frequencies decreasing? This is a Problem. So to explain the decrease in frequency, I, ex I first need to explain the policy behind that quarter grand contest. I'm not trying to have a hard contest, but I want to have uh, novel problems, and I want to have only novel problems. Oh, it's time consuming. I actually, I can just quit. <laughs> okay. Okay. Then I just want to explain some easy uh, or interesting part of this. Problem. Okay, I'll explain the word to finals. Okay, the word to finals is a uh, contest that um, uh, gathers uh, all participants all over the world, and all over the world, and yeah, without lazy limits. So its our ultimate goal is the GCD and TCLs, and we have streams like here, and also we have heuristic division from this year and. Uh, currently, uh, the nine out of the 12 uh, top runners are Japanese, so please participate in heuristic divisions too. Uh, well, so, Hatakura sponsor, Hatakura uh, got earned money by sponsors, and we have uh, some matching service between Smith. And but how do we earn by English providing English contests? Uh, actually, we don't earn anything from it. So, Hatakura World Finance is entirely. Uh, Contribution to the community, so thank you to your Chogudai, and and also I there are some preparation topics I like to omit completely, and so uh, uh, our our writers uh, mainly from Japan, but uh, there are some different uh, different kind of people. Like uh, the most interesting one is uh, faculty from medicine <laughs> is writing some problems, and okay, so. Uh, some people ask us to hold contests. Uh, is, there, is there a possibility to hold Atkuro contests uh, outside Japan? Uh, actually, we had one in 2014, but uh, we had only once. So it may be uh, if, if Atkuro has evolved. OK, we are looking forward to your participation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sorry for the time. <laughs> All right, um, so any questions? Yeah, okay, are there a couple? Uh, just one quick question. Are all of your uh, problem statements now available in English or only some? 
Uh, excuse me? Yeah. Are all of your problem statements now submitted also in English or are only some? Um, maybe you can submit it in any language, but we have an interpreter. And if Japanese writers, like, I got, if we, I got submissions from, uh, I got submissions from, I got submissions from uh, foreign writers from in quarter forces, uh, but only for agencies. Uh, they submit problems in English. Um, and but for Japanese writers, I get submissions from Japanese. And most of the writers are Japanese, so, yeah. Thanks for the answer. Um, Etienne? Hi. So compared to some other contests like ICPC or Code Forces, uh, at Codo has a reputation of having problems that are very math heavy, right? Uh, lots of counting permutations and not so many problems involving data yeah. structures. Is that an intentional style? And if so, what's the reason for this? Uh, okay. Actually, there is a slide that explains that part. <laughs> okay. And okay, but uh, I'm missing. So uh, the reason why the re I'm we are focusing on some. Uh, Thinking ability. So, it, in data, for example, in data structure tasks, uh, it is often the case that it's how the part only comes from implementation details, and the idea itself is easy. So, I don't you like to use that task. And uh, for and on the other hand, counting problems, uh, it's often the case that it's easy to implement, but it's hard to come up with. So, they are, tend to uh, show up in at on this. And and in geometry problems, like. Uh, this way is much uh, simpler because it's hard to prepare geometry problems. So we don't have that many. Okay. Cool. Um, any more questions from the audience? Maybe one or two. Okay. Oh, same set of questions. Same set of up, uh, question. Uh, so the Japanese, you like, you are known for having very good problems. Do you have any tips on how to come up with good, good problems? Uh, actually. Uh, we we had some problem creating camp uh, at some time, like gathering some Japanese writers to and go to some sightseeing spot and and having having rest and just um, creating problems together. I think that could be one of the reason to. And then we ex uh, share some problem creating tips or. Just to win. Cool. Um, one last question. Oh, sure. It's like a running exercise. Oh, I know that a lot of people who submit uh, problems to Ecuador also submit to JUI, like JUI, JUI or JUI Spring Camp. Uh, are they related somehow, like directly or indirect, indirectly? Uh, yeah, for Atcoder holds the qualification round of GOIs, but uh, problem preparation process is completely different. GOI has its its own admins, and Atcoder has own admins. Like some, many of them are just belonging to all, all both Atcoder writers and GOI writers. But uh, as a system, they are completely different. All right, um, so let's, uh, for the time, uh, sake of time, uh, let's give a round of applause again for you. Thank you. All right, uh, and then we have a final presentation from Suhyun Park. So if you can be, come on forward, and then I'll give the the Medal of the Honor. Oh, hello. <laughs> My name is Seon Park, and I'm from the Republic of Korea. Uh, I competed in the ISPC World Finals in Moscow, uh, and I'm currently an undergraduate student at Sogang University. I would like to introduce a project called Sol.ac, which changed how Korea trains for competitive programming. Uh, I will introduce the platform, explain why I created it, and discuss the challenges while I faced uh, while I developing the difficulty system. So, SOAP.ac is a website that assigns difficulty levels and text to programming problems through collective intelligence and ranks problem solvers based on the problems they've solved. Uh, some of you may already know SOAP.ac as the arena contest, but assigning difficulty levels to problem uh, archive is the main mm, feature of the platform. 
Sob.hc currently provides difficulty levels and tags for 24,000 problems uh, based on 500,000 contributions from 4,000 contributors. The problems are from the Korean uh, Baekjun Online Judge, uh, BOJ for short, which is a huge problem archive in Korea. Uh, it supports grading most competitions uh, whose test cases have been released online. Uh, for example, this ranges from uh, university club competitions to ICPC regionals and the world finals, and also some Olympiad problems as well. Uh, it is significant that many of these problems, uh, including those from the competitions mentioned earlier, uh, have been integrated into a single difficulty system. For example, these are the difficulty levels for uh, our school's local competition and the NWRC, the World Finals Luxor problems, and the IOI 2023 problems. This is calculated based on the contributions of the people who have solved these problems from the uh, aforementioned uh, online source BOJ. Problems are divided into six tiers, uh, bronze, silver, gold, platinum, diamond, and ruby. Each tier is further divided into five sub-tiers. Bronze and silver problems are suitable for practicing for beginners. Uh, gold and platinum problems are challenging. Uh, and being able to solve diamond problems within the contest time can determine qualification for world finals. Ruby problems are so difficult that uh, I think that even teams at the World Finals rarely solve them. Uh, roughly compared with code boosters problem ratings, uh, bronze is about 800 and gold is about 1.7 thousand and diamond is about 2.7 thousand. Also, there are tags that indicate the algorithms or data structures necessary for solving the problems. Uh, there are around 200 of them, uh, which include broad topics like string, mathematics, uh, graph theory, uh, and some very narrow topics like knapsack, uh, planar graphs, and like split trees. Users can use the advanced search feature to, for problems they want to study or problems that match their skill level. By combining difficulty uh, filters and source filter, solve status, tags, number of solvers, and well, etc. For example, the query on the screen shows that uh, uh, if I want to search for ICPC regional or world finals that range from gold 3 to platinum 5, that, has, uh, that is solvable with dynamic programming or greedy, and uh, that I uh, haven't solved. Additionally, some curated problem sets exist. Mm. The Sprout tier is designed for beginners who are just starting to uh, solve programming problems. Uh, we are also for class problem sets uh, curated based on popular recommendations to help users study topics frequently seen in coding interviews or competitive programming. The class problem sets are uh, structured in 10 levels ranging from beginner to advanced, making it easy to progress step by step. So that AC not only helps users find suitable problems, but also encourages them to solve more difficult problems. Uh, let me explain the rating system that aids in this process. Uh, it is different from contest, um, contest platforms because we do not do contest and First, we still assign integer points for each problem difficulty, like one point for bronze five problems, two points for bronze four problems, and so on, to 30 points for ruby one problems. A user's rating is determined by summing the points of their top 100 solved problems, and minor metrics like solved problem counts and completion status of uh, aforementioned class problem sets. Based on this rating, uh, the user's tier is calculated this system motivates users to solve more challenging problems. Once the user has solved 100 problems, they need to solve more difficult problems than their 100 solved problems to increase their rating. For example, uh, this is my profile. Uh, for me to increase my rating, I have to solve diamond four or higher. 
Uh, this is the important part. Uh, users can contribute to problems by voting on their perceived difficulty and the tags using their solution for the problems they have solved. Uh, when users become platinum higher, their contribution counts towards to calculating the uh, official difficulty that SolvedAC provides. First, the contributions are sorted by difficulty, and then the top and bottom 10% are trimmed. The remaining contributions are sorted by time, uh, and a weighted average is calculated using a uh, half-life of one year. So the contributions can be made anytime, so the problem's difficulty can change, also change uh, over time. This reflects the community's tendency to become more familiar with new techniques over time. Uh, it also reflects new technologies, for example, uh, when the in operator of Python 3.10 enabled linear matching of strings, levels of laptop KMP problems got quickly decreased. The problem difficulty, user tiers, and contributions form a virtual cycle that defines solve.ac. User tiers motivates users to solve difficult problems and improve their skills. Once users have solved enough problems, they can contribute directly to the problem set, recommending problems based on the methods they have learned to new learners. This is the community guide for everyone model that Solve.ac advocates. Now, let me first talk about the Korean competitive programming scene uh, before explaining why Solve.ac was created. Uh, there was Baek Jun Chae. Uh, I think he participated in the World Finals Beijing, uh, who made the Sogong University Programming Club. He created BOJ after his name uh, and started archiving problems from every contest around the world possible. Actually, his hobby is to archive problems from contests. The BOJ translated some problems into Korean to help students focus on training computational thinking rather than uh, dealing with language barriers. Um, also, BOJ supported school and club competitions and allowed BOJ to be used as a competition platform making many schools hold contests in BOJ. This made BOJ very famous in Korea, and it now has 30,000 problems and over a half million accounts. Every student preparing for coding interviews and programming competitions in Korea, uh, I think they get help from the BOJ. But finding the correct problems to solve from this extensive pool was an entirely different challenge. Uh, when someone first assesses BOJ, you see problems numbered 1,000, 1,001, and so on. However, there was no indicator for uh, problem difficulty at the moment BOJ was created. So if you try to solve the problems in order starting from 1,000, uh, you encounter two simple input-output problems. The title is A plus B and A minus B, followed by three slightly more thought uh, thought provoking problems. Uh, but then you hit the wall with problem 1005 with the gold tier, which requires, I think, topological sorting, and problem 1006 at the platinum tier, which is uh, some hard dynamic programming. Generally, gold to platinum level problems are of medium difficulty in ICPC regionals, requiring much training. Uh, what often happened was that Newcomers would start solving problems in order for 1,000, and so on, and get stuck on the platinum problem at 1,006. This could not be very encouraging for beginners who have just started to engage in the competitive programming field. After struggling with such difficult problems, their fear of the field would only grow. Moreover, there were few problems with an algorithm classification. So after solving some problems recommended by like club seniors, uh, students had to find new study materials on their own. Also, while finding problems on your own can be enjoyable, given the nature of this field, which covers a very wide uh, range of knowledge, students might encounter problems that require completely unfamiliar concepts like uh, 
think about a student who has just learned BFS. Um, might finish all the problems recommended by seniors, and they start looking for more problems independently, but they might search and choose a problem that seems solvable with BFS, only to discover that it involves advanced topics like uh, triisomorphism. Numerous attempts have been made to estimate the problem's difficulty before then. For example, there was a service called BOJTR, which calculated problem difficulty based on the statistical method and defined the program's tier based on the difficulties of their solved problems. However, the, because the difficulty was calculated statistically, the system had a loophole. Uh, one could increase one's tiers in infinitely by solving non-Korean problems that few people attempted. Despite this, watching my tier and experience points grow on the site was quite enjoyable. So I thought back in 2019, when I was the president of Sogang University uh, Province Solving Club. Inspired by this, I thought it would be great if our club members could rate the difficulty and classify the problems, then calculate tiers based on this information, uh, instead of relying on statistical methods. Since the staff were already recommending problems for study materials, compiling all these recommendations into a database uh, would make it easier to pre prepare study materials later. This would also make it easier for, for club members to choose problems when studying alone, and the personal tier would motivate them to tackle more challenging problems, making the study of algorithmic problem solving more enjoyable. If those who benefited from this system contributed back to help future learners, it would create a positive feedback loop. Thus, the first version of Solve.ac was completed in 2019. Uh, a few senior club members gathered to assign difficulties. Since everyone had different opinions, we established some basic guidelines. Uh, we decided on difficulties by averaging multiple contributions. Fortunately, Solve.ac expanded quickly in Korea through word of mouth among various schools and organizations. Many people enjoy sharing their opinions on the problems they have solved. Oh, now you may ask, OK, that's good. But isn't calculating based on user contributions inherently less accurate than statistical methods? Can a proper difficulty system be established this way? Yeah, from the creation of the platform until now, uh, continuous considerations have been made what constitutes difficulty and how to rate it. Because problems uh, resist on BOJ are not always from contests, and if they did, they're mostly like not rated like code forces or adcoder. So we could not use methods like code forces or adcoder problems where problem difficulty is statistically calculated based on contest results. The BOJ tier site, which I briefly mentioned earlier, was also one of the reasons we couldn't use statistical methods. Therefore, realizing that we couldn't determine the difficulty accurately through statistics, I decided to look at the best effort method instead. Uh, one method for this was to initially define a minimum difficulty for each algorithm in the contribution guidelines. For example, basic graph traversal was set as silver one with additional steps added for applications and more steps for impl implementation would increase the difficulty. However, this initial guidelines of formalizing and fixing the minimum difficulty for algorithms gained little consensus from contributors. There were various reasons for this. For example, the guidelines set the KMP algorithm with a low base difficulty because it is taught in the first section of the second year course at Sogang University. Uh, however, this did not resonate well with contributors as it is generally not taught in the curricula at the other universities. Hence, the university community failed to agree on the minimum difficulty value. There were also many negative opinions about documenting the minimum difficulty for well. As mentioned earlier, there were instances where lesser known algorithms become widely recognized after appearing in a specific con contest. Opinions suggested that fixing something that changed can change dynamically over time in a document doesn't make sense. 
Therefore, I concluded that defining difficulty using this method was invalid and discarded these guidelines. However, because it is possible to contribute difficulty mechanically when there was a minimal difficulty for algorithm, discarding the guidelines made it difficult for contributors to determine what difficulty to assign for problems. This was mainly because there is a personal variation in problem difficulty, for example, based on mathematical background knowledge. Consider a learner who started solving problems after studying mathematics and another who studied after studying programming. When they encounter a problem that requires understanding complex mathematical concepts, but can be implemented in just three lines of code, uh, their evaluations will be vastly different. Concepts like number theory might be common knowledge for someone with a background in mathematics, whereas they might not be for someone with a programming background. Conversely, problems with a lot of implementation might seem relatively easy for someone who studied programming. Ultimately, since the difficulty perceived by individuals can vary depending on their background, the one-dimensional scholar difficulty would be always inaccurate by at least some point of view. So I experimented with allowing difficulty to be input at a vector value instead of a scholar value. Like there are two or three sliders to input the difficulty. Yet, the community's reaction was mostly negative, with comments like difficulty balding has become annoying, and there are too many indicators making it confusing. If difficulty balding became cumbersome, contributors would be less likely to provide their opinions, ultimately making it uh, inaccurate in another way. Therefore, this approach was also not suitable. So, if the platform had to project difficulty on to a one-dimensional space, I thought about what knowledge its difficulty levels problem should require. Effectively finding the line or curve uh, we should project the problems to. Um. For example, bronze problems should be suitable for people solving problem, programming problems for the first time. We would overrepresent these groups that we only consider GPT students or math majors. In reality, many more developers have started solving programming problems to prepare for coding interviews. Therefore, it is more accurate to assure that, on average, they possess, they possess limited mathematical knowledge or intuition. If complex mathematical concepts appear but the implementation is simple, assigning such problems to bronze or silver might make the so-called locals wonder, uh, do I have to solve these problems to really pass coding interviews. However, to both, one had to reach platinum. I hope that platinum would be a tier requiring solving serious competition problems to advance. So by the time they reach this level, the certain level of mathematical knowledge mentioned earlier becomes very required. While it is not an issue for problems at the platinum level to require such mathematical knowledge, it might be problematic if only programmers at or above the platinum level can evaluate bronze or silver problems. Ultimately, it led to a situation, leads to a situation where you need to appeal to programmers at the pro platinum or higher to raise the difficulty for problems that are, for example, one-liner but with a mass background. After much contemplation over the solution provided by many ideas. Uh, the solution was to revise the contribution guidelines, define many standard difficulty problems that should act as contribution guides where their difficulty is fixed by SODAC, um, and allow programs below Platinum to both as well. While contributions made by gold or below programmers still does not count towards the final difficulty provided by SODAC, Platinum or higher users can read their contribution messages as reference. Although we could not precisely define the difficulty of a problem, after revising the guidelines, we succeeded to settle on which problem is relatively easier or harder based on the standard problems. 
The difficulty of each problem gradually, gradually converts to reflect the problem-solving skills that people who mainly solve problems at that level are likely to have. It was sufficient to help learners grow step by step, which met the initial vision of the project. Uh, let's now explore how learners can utilize of the to pro progress from solving their first programming problems to competing in programming contests. When someone who is just starting programming signs into solve the DC, the first thing they see is the Sprout problems uh, created by us. The Sprout problems consist of 38 problems that are designed to familiarize learners with programming language syntax and basic problem solving, including topics like output, input, and calculations, conditions, and loops. By solving these problems, uh, learners become accustomed to programming problems and become interested in increasing their rating and tier. Once they have solved a good number of spot problems, SOP.ac recommends problems from the class series. Okay. SOP.ac encourages learners to solve class problems by granting significant rating boost for completing them. I chose problems many people have solved or their solutions are often available online. It will encourage learners to seek help through searching online, progressively allowing them to learn new data structures, algorithms, and mathematical concepts. Higher classes include advanced topics used primarily in programming contests like in class eight or FFTs, heavy light decompositions. Therefore, even after understanding basic techniques, it is worthwhile to continue solving class problems to prepare for competitions. As learners solve problems, they might identify areas where they struggle or topics they wish to practice more. Uh, to practice specific topics, they can select text from the tag menu, solving problems by difficulty or number of solvers. Once learners have become familiar with common topics in coding interviews or contests, they may want to participate in mock interviews or con mock contests. Uh, various community contests on BOJ can help with this. We encourage participation by offering profile decorations for contest particip participation, motivating learners to try out competitions. The platform also aims to make learners preparing for coding interviews be interested in competitive programming as well. Learners who have participated in several contests will soon realize that the absence of difficulty levels and tags on contest problems significantly increase problem solving difficulty. For example, it's often hard to decide whether to use DP or greedy algorithms to solve a problem. While they can refer to tags while solving problems alone, they cannot do so during contests. At this stage, it is beneficial to attempt what we call random defense. Uh, which, which is known in the solve data community to be an effective training method. Typically, this involves selecting and solving random problems from a difficulty pool, which, such as silver or gold random defenses. The platform search feature supports random sorting. Thus, learners, learners can filter a problem pool and practice solving problems randomly chosen. Also, we allow hiding difficulty levels and tag lists to aid this practice. Mm. Recently, to encourage learning similar to random defense, we introduced the random marathon feature, which randomly selects eight problems of appropriate difficulty each week based on the learner's skill level. This is adaptive, so it changes according to the learner's performance in the previous week to provide problems suited to their skill level. Also, when learners start to um, form an ICPC team and start team training, our search feature can assist in selecting problem sets as well. For example, to practice with enter ERC problems, they can use the query on screen to check if any of the three team members have already solved problems from the contest. And they can refer to the problem levels as well. Searching and utilizing more than 30,000 prob problems registered on BOJ using various filters is a significant advantage for learners preparing for programming contests. Oh, because of the time, we will skip future plans. And yeah. For learners preparing for team competitions like ICPC, we are all, all 
<laughs> it escaped. OK. Scanning the QR code on the screen will allow you to read detailed instructions on how to sign up for Sol.ac and learn about its features. Although some problems are written in Korean, uh, most of the website is in English, and it provides a feature to translate contributions left in Korean. So if you're curious about the difficulty rating of a particular problem or contest, and if you're willing to contribute, please visit the site by scanning the QR code. Uh, thank you for listening, and I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you so much, Suhyun. <laughs> Did you say you are an undergraduate student? <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, maybe you should consider a PhD. Anyone has hand up? Thank you for the amazing talk. I actually have so many questions, but I think I will ask only two. Uh, first of all, I'm. Uh, I'm sorry if I missed. Do you have a, your own judge, or you uh, forward users to another judges where you found the problem? And the second one, you uh, mentioned this class problems. It's often very difficult to find problems which are very helpful to like learn an algorithm and without any additional like math trick question or something like that. Did you create these problems yourself for this platform, or where did you find them? Uh, first of all, uh, the Judge platform is not created by me. Uh, actually, when I first started to create the platform, I tried to make my own online judge, but uh, when I as I explained earlier, the BOJ was already very famous in Korea. Uh, everyone was using it, and it had a lot of lot of problems, uh, even before them. So I thought it, it could be beneficial to use the uh, existing, existing platform to rate problem difficulties and um, make it more better. Uh, the class problems are mostly from problem ar archive, but some of them are uh, created by me as well. Uh, last year, Solta DC uh, actually held some contests called Arena Contest to uh, showcase some Korean uh, good problems from the Korean community. And from that contest, uh, some problems in that contest get included in the class problem sets as well. Hey, thank you. Any other question? All right, I think the audience is kind of set up to sleep because we are running off. But please, this is not the end. You saw the faces. Uh, please uh, feel free to do the peer interaction as you see them uh, walking by, right? Because that's probably where the best ideas happen. So if you don't remember them, just take a picture of their badge. There is their name, right? And you can reach out to them on LinkedIn. So you probably will, uh, will utilize that connection later on when you forget, oh, what was the name of that tool? Um, do you have any feedback uh, so far on the CLI that you would like to jump in and just say something what you would like to see the next year or something like that? If not, of course, uh, we will be sending a survey later on as well. But if someone so wants to jump in. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, so um, any, uh, each and every one of you, uh, if you have any candid feedback you'd like to actually give, uh, this is a great opportunity um, to give. And also, I'd like to address that um, if any of you would like to actually give a presentation, like the ones that are given today, um, I'll, I'd love to have you. Uh, actually, I and Tomas, or Tomas and I. Uh, so please do fill it out. Um, and uh, we are really here to hopefully uh, make this even a greater event uh, in the coming years. Um, and that's what I'm aiming for. So let's try to drive it together. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone.